<clears throat> okay, so today we're going to be um, talking about measuring performance. So not actually improving your performance, but measuring it. Um, two areas we're talking about are profiling and micro benchmarking. Hadley has this quote that before you can make a code faster, you should figure out what making it, it's making it slow. It sounds easy, but it's not. I think it can be easy to find the slow code sometimes, and it can not be easy some other times, depends on the scale of the stuff you're doing. Um, my code, where it's slow, it's, it hangs and it's, I can tell it's slow. So I don't know if this is fully applicable all the time, but it is good to be able to actually put numbers to a lot of this stuff, uh, which you can't do unless you're really using profiling. So we're gonna be using the um, prof viz. So this is to visualize your profiling and uh, the bench package for micro benchmarking. And then we're gonna use the beer awards data set. I think we had talked about using this at some point in time, but um, I thought I would try and use some beer related content, to make this fun. Not that, you know, profiling isn't fun, but you know, <laughs> to, to add a little bit here. This might be the first actual appearance of that data set. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so profiling, uh, the primary tool to understand performance uh, when you're, is called a profiler and um, R uses uh, a sampling or statistical profiler. So this is basically, it, it, it stops your execution code every few milliseconds to record what's going on and record how long it's taking. Uh, the objective of this is to figure out kind of sequentially what it is that is being done and what is it, how long is it taking to do those things. Right, so this is kind of how you how you get across that. Uh, I don't know of other types of profiling. I didn't look into it more, but this seems to be the the main avenue that R does. Um, I haven't heard of other versions of this in R. So if you have another version, feel free to uh, let me know at the end. So a, a quick example. This is from Hadley. Uh, you have these three functions, and always we have these nested functions going on uh, to prove our point. And so you've got F that has G and H inside of it, and G has H inside itself, and then H um, just as a pause, and there's a pause uh, among all of them. If we want to see what's going on in terms of uh, what's taking how much time, we just wrap profis on it and uh, curly brackets so you can run it in line. So um, I'm not sure, really, not totally sure on when you don't need the curly brackets, but I've been using the curly brackets all the time to make this work. So. Um, I just put them in. I assume that you have to do that. Uh, if it's not kosher or it's not the exact way to do it, I'm sorry, but you'll still get the same information. And uh, what we get out is a, at least in our studio, is you get another tab that pops up beside um, your, um, your script or your markdown. And it will say um, profile and then a number, uh, unless I think you can name them, but profile one is kind of the most likely thing you'll see. And um, you click on that pane and then you have uh, on the top, you'll have uh, two tabs, flame graph and data. And the flame graph will show this kind of visualization of the code. So it shows each code section and then uh, how much time it took. Uh, obviously larger bars is gonna mean that it takes more time. And it's not really intuitive sometimes because here you'll see like, it looks like H takes uh, a lot of time even though it's the smallest element but that's because H is being called twice. So it, it, it's the call of H occurred twice and thus the, the, it takes more, it shows it as more time. Um, so it can be somewhat confusing if you look only at the top half, but if we look at the bottom half, um, which sits below it, you can see this full call stack uh, chronologically. And here we can see that H um, does get called twice. The pauses there sit above G, H and H and then G and F are there as well. So uh, we can see actually chronologically going from left to right how long something takes. And um, oh. yeah, so we can notice over the, uh, the actual pieces, something has gone away here. This is annoying, hold on. Oh, here we go. Can you guys see this now? Yeah. That's so weird. All right, well, um, this is what happens when you try and put it into share again, which does not actually want you to do this. Um, so yeah, so you can mouse over it and you can see individual pieces. Uh, this isn't the prettiest, but you can see how much time it takes from those labels there, the aggregated time. And uh, you can see where it actually lines up with um, that part. So it's, it's, it's more interactive than you would think. 
That's really uh, cool. And then when, when you go it's to cool how you got that in the presentation. <laughs> Uh, yeah it's so we're gonna have some hackiness going through because i don't think it really likes that but yeah <laughs> um and yeah so when you go to the data version or view you get this nested you know sort of thing so it's giving me a markdown first because we're inside the markdown um calls but yeah you can see kind of each part and how much time it's taking so if you have um a large um segment of code that you're looking through and you're trying to find something that's deeply nested in there that's taking a lot of time you know so say maybe h took or sorry f took a lot of time i want to figure out where an f all that time is coming from you know i might be able to find oh it's actually the pause that's doing it everything else is not really causing any trouble so you know that's the utility of the the data versus the flame <clears throat> so the the main area I've run into uh, wanting to profile is when I have uh, something that's running slow and I don't think it should. And kind of the main thing that comes up that isn't code related or well, it's code related, but isn't code itself is the garbage collector. Uh, if the garbage collector is taking a lot of time, it means you've, you're building either um, a lot of short lived objects, like you're building something and replacing it um, or building and deleting things quickly or you're uh, building large things and then having to clean out a bunch of extra memory from little things that you've built before. So uh, that takes up a lot of time. So you, you kind of, it, it will show up and you want to avoid, if you can, creating unnecessary uh, cleaning. Uh, so if you can not create extra writes, that's a good thing. So we have an example here using our Bureau Awards data set where I made a naive uh, bootstrap indices. And so the, you know, we're, we're going through 10 bootstraps and we're going to make, you know, 10 sets of lists of IDs. And um, we start with just an integer, an empty integer um, vector. And then we're just appending to it every time with a sample from the um, length of your awards. Okay. And this is not that fast for how long it should take. Do you guys have any guesses as to why that's not that fast? you're overwriting the same object over and over again and it has to clean up the previous version of it yeah. each time yeah so if we go to um the um profiling here we see that we're losing a lot of time because we're um, running a garbage collector right here so what happens is um this memory column which we didn't see any use of last time uh, it's requiring memory, but it's also requiring freeing of memory. So we're freeing memory here um, every time we run this. And when we look down here, we can actually see the garbage collector comes up a whole bunch of times. So this would this would kind of lead me to believe this is not the most effective way to do this. Um, and um, actually, how we can you know this is a copy and modify issue, and we're going to learn how to mitigate some of those in chapter twenty four, but uh, one easy way, which I'll show you guys, is maybe we just pre-assign it to be, you know, uh, an integer of length of thousand to begin with, and our total time is uh, 670 milliseconds, and it was before 2150. So we've divided our time by three just by mixing that one change. So, Gosh, can I ask a question uh, about the slide before? Sorry. Um, yeah. So, is are like is the, all those spikes on like the the kind of the second and third or third and fourth layers are those garbage collector events? Uh, so it's things that are happening um, inside. Oh, it's the gray. Them. Oh, it's the gray. Yeah, gray is the garbage collector, yeah. and then we have yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is the function call for this function, which is anonymous, which is going to be confusing. Uh, which is one of the limitations that we'll talk about in a second. And then we have the sampling inside of it. And then there's the sample into which it calls. And then there's a garbage collector inside of that also. So this is, you know, this is the stack that's happening when we run this and then run this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So limitations, which is where I just kind of alluded to, one of them. Um, well, I guess I could talk about them in order. 
the first one is you can't do anything with C code or Fortran code or really any other language code that's called by R. C is the base of a lot of stuff, but Fortran, as we'll see later, is the base of some other things. And so you can't really see any of that code. And if you have code that's called by that, that's really slow. You have to look at that itself. Um, and actually at the um, Global R Studio conference, there was a presentation on this new package, XRProf, which um, you can use to do um, profiling and it will show you all the profiling. It's for the C section as well. Uh, it took uh, considerably more effort than I was willing to do for this presentation to set that up, but uh, you can do so if you'd like. Um, it looks like a cool way if you if you think you have problems with the C code or your, your writing C code um, to have it all kind of in the same area. The second one is anonymous functions can be extremely vague and confusing. So if we go back to, um, yeah, actually this will work. This example, we have fun all these places. And that's just because this function is not defined by a name. And so it doesn't, you know, you can't actually break this down any further to know what the heck's going on here, but that's the call of this function here because it's anonymous. So where you can, you should write out your functions. If I was smarter, this would be, you know, a function on its own and then it would just be calling the function. Uh, and the last one is uh, lazy evaluation can make things really confusing and things not named what you think they should be. Um, and we have an example, um, <clears throat> which is in this case, we have I, uh, which is just a pause and then 10 and J, which is um, takes a input X and then um, adds 10 to it. And so if we profile um, J of, um, of I, it just shows up as I was a pause inside of it. And so I guess because of the, the promise of evaluation of this, I shows up, but this is not actually being doing anything yet. And so it doesn't show up on this bar. So it is very confusing. Uh, this example in total was somewhat confusing to me, but um, I do understand that lazy evaluation can cause uh, confusion and that's what I did. Uh, any questions about profiling? Uh, the next section's on uh, micro benchmarking. Yeah, I've definitely had trouble. Um, like the times that I've wanted to use it are uh, when I've made something large, right? So I have like a whole dashboard or something and you can throw the dashboard through uh, ProfViz and that, that flame chart, that flame graph is just completely overwhelming. And I was like, well, that didn't help at all. Yeah. Um, so I, ne I never really figured out how to, you know, take a whole dashboard and, and figure out what's what's gumming it up. But yeah, I I I tried. Well, I actually, I, I successfully used it to speed up a bunch of code I had to run uh, one of our models. But in doing so, I had to use it on subsections, split up the sections, and then see how much you know what's taking the, the long amounts of time, and how can I um, speed up those sections. So it isn't really effective on the, the totality of it, just like you said, because like, I look at it and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this. This is too much stuff. Um, I have a demo at the end and I'm pretty sure that's exactly the point we'll make is that this is too difficult to read, but. Um, all right. Um, so micro benchmarking. So micro benchmarking is just measuring things that are really, really small, uh, the performance of them. Um, so milliseconds to nanoseconds. So this is, you know, much faster than uh, your, you know, profiling could do. And it's um, sort of much more fine grained than your profiling could do. And it's not really designed to work on large pieces of code. So this might be something that's like a function that runs on an atomic vector or a read, write, something really small. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of repeat this, but there's, uh, you should be very wary of generalizing what you find from micro benchmarking as being more important or, in, or, or being important at all to uh, complex code. There's a million other things that are going on with complex code that are going to overwrite the small amount of performance value you're going to get from um, micro benchmarking. I assume this isn't true in things like, um, you know, like the financial trading world where they have to be super crazy fast and, you know, those little nanoseconds count. But here, I don't think 
in our analyst world that's really that important. Uh, and the package we use is the bench package. And uh, I think that's the that's the the one for our, or it's at least the one that the Tide Universe uh, recommends. And uh, uses a high precision timer, and so we can compare these really small things. And I, I wanted to kind of think more about the practical utility of micro benchmarking because I, I I myself didn't think of this as being that important or that useful. And everything I looked up really was like, if you're building Linux code or something else that where you need to be really fast or you're worried about read write speed, uh, you know, with bottlenecking of things, or you have some little operation that you're running all the time that you think should be fast, should it be faster? Those were kind of the times it was used. Uh, and um, we have this nice quote, uh, we should forget about small efficiencies, uh, say about 97% of the time, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if all evil, but you know, some evil, sure. Yeah, and and one point that stuck with me when I was looking this up and researching this was that there's a lot of variability due to optimization uh, within your computer itself, and so you can't really um, generalize a lot of micro benchmarking that you would do on your own computer. Uh, so it's not really the most useful thing. Like generalize it to other environments or is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you have, like I would say maybe you have some very readable thing that's like, I don't know, like um, nanoseconds faster so than some extremely unreadable thing that's not going to be at all useful to someone else to try and debug. And you are thinking about using that. That might not actually be any better. You know, it's maybe better on your micro mm -hmm. benchmarking, but not to someone else. So something with clarity might be more useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we'll still uh, explain how it works. Um, yeah, so here's an example. And uh, wanted to see if the like pre-cooked um, uh, e to the minus one or so e to the x minus one versus just e to the x minus one, which is faster. And so um, we throw it in the bench function here and you just put each line or each, each expression on a separate line. And uh, we're gonna you know, have um, 100 values, uh, random uniform, just to, as, because you need something for it to evaluate on. And uh, so if, you know, if you have your own code, you know, maybe this evaluation is this x, vector is something different, but you know, that's just a kind of an easy way. It doesn't really matter what it is, so long as it's the same complexity that you're intending, the actual utility of it. Uh, well, the way that the mark uh, function works is it runs each expression at least once, depending on how long it takes, and at most as many times as it can do in half a second. So it just keeps running the same thing over and over and over again to try and get more reps of the same um, expression to see, you know, like how long it takes on average um, or on median in this case. And you, you get an output that looks uh, somewhat like this. And we're going to talk about the different ones um, or sort of what all this means in a few slides. But what we can see here um, pretty quickly is that the pre-cooked one is uh, slightly faster um, at the minimum. And it is um, a good little bit faster on the median. And you have to make sure you're mindful of units because we have um, micro and nano. And so we have to make sure that you know we remember that mu is bigger than n. Uh, and we'll go into the rest of the details there uh, on another slide. And so uh, one gotcha, and when I was just playing with this, I ran into it before I actually finished reading all of uh, Hadley's notes. So good on him to actually include it. Uh, but I did run into this, and you probably run into this if you just blindly use this is that uh, the output has to be identical. And if the output's not the same, it's going to, um, it's probably gonna cause you some problems. First of all, it's gonna fail uh, or cause an error, um, but also it's trying to make it as apples as, as to apples. My headphones are gonna die. So I actually have to switch headphones. So hold on one second.
All right, can you guys hear me still? Yep. Okay, yep. cool. Well, that was much more seamless than I thought it could have been. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so what we want to do is we want to override um, the check to say check equals false. So here, if we we're going to try and do another index sampling example. I might try sample uh, between 1 and 100 100 times or uh, round uh, a random uniform. Uh, There's 100 of them between uh, 1 and 100. And um, <clears throat> this will run because we have check equals false. And uh, if we look at the results from this, this is going to be our example we use, um, the things that we're most interested in are going to be min, median, and iterations per second. So iterations per second is kind of your total aggregate. Uh, median we want to use uh, because we have a, usually a skewed distribution on, um, <clears throat> on our uh, values. And then min is going to be um, you know, interesting, but not nearly as useful. And what we can see in this case is that um, actually using the round with the random uniform is faster. Um, I didn't. I just chose this example at random, so I, I wasn't looking for anything enlightening. But this is not the, what I expected. I expected it to be the other way around. Um, and yeah, so we, uh, you know, it, on the minimum it's it's better, and on the median it's it's even better. And we have you know roughly uh, eighty thousand more iterations. And interestingly, there's a garbage collection that occurs, which um, we'll talk about on the next slide. And so <clears throat> there are a bunch of extra columns. And uh, you don't see them on this slide because uh, by default, if you're using micro benchmark in a R markdown, it will not show you these the extra columns, but it will show you them. It's a tibble of size 13 um, if you um, just output this raw, but in a markdown, it's not. It's a, it, It'll only show you the six columns. So you have to change something in your markdown, which uh, if that's at all used to you, I can explain that to what you guys after. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, looking past this, the memory allocation is slightly higher for our rounding case. Um, and, uh, you know, total time should be pretty much the same. Oh, no, it's not. Oh. Total time is higher. Interesting, because it has to run. Oh, it's trying to run the same number of iterations. So total time to run the same number of iterations. Interesting. Um, cool. I'm learning as you guys are. So, um, yeah. And so uh, with that, we can kind of see all of these pieces. These are a bit more descriptive, not not nearly as important as the uh, kind of for performance sake for the first ones. The garbage collector is interesting and useful. Um, to know how much, you know, if garbage collecting is occurring and how many times garbage collecting is occurring. So there's two garbage, garbage collections that occurred um, to run the sample. <clears throat> and then um, kind of for your own debugging purposes, you can um, look at the results. You can look at the um, time and um, the memory, which are all kind of lists with you know, additional information. Um, I had previously used the results to make sure that I was outputting the right things for both of them. So it was as close to apples to apples as I intended. So that's, um, that would be kind of the utility that I've seen from it. <clears throat> and then you can also plot it by just putting a um, plot around the object. So um, in this case, what you would do uh, is you would just store this as an object uh, and then you would just put plot on it. You have to have GGB swarm. Um, installed for this to work and uh, my R updated recently so I didn't so that I learned this but you know that is important to know and uh, to that point uh, we with this we can see that it is really right skewed uh, this is a log scale and so um, that's why we're using the median not the mean uh, and usually it's a multi it's <clears throat> it's multimodality on your computer because you have things running in the background so you know if I'm running this code and Maybe I, you know, I'm watching Hulu on my laptop at the same time, which I may have been doing while I was writing this. Then you know that uh, could cause some of these nice uh, peaks over here. So um, that's kind of you know that's why you're going to see something like that. Um, that's the last bit on micro benchmarking. I have a live demo um, to kind of do some profiling with. But do you guys have any questions about micro benchmarking? 
I uh, I just wonder, like, um, the main question that's going through my head with these two uh, sections was like, does the profiling itself change the performance of the thing you're measuring? Like, because it has to like slightly like interrupt it, right, in order to to like yeah. get a reading, like the sampling. I, I uh, not that it matters that much, but I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we're supposed to treat it kind of how you would treat like AIC, which is like it's only relative to the, uh, you know, to itself or to things using the exact same data. So right. don't, don't worry about like the time is, you know, make the time smaller. Don't, don't yeah, worry yeah, about yeah. You know, like the exact time. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's like a reliable, reliability versus validity. Mm -hmm. like if you're, throwing at a target, like they all clump together, but they're not in the center versus all being, yeah. But they're like reliably all, you know, yeah. they, their relationships to each other are all, you know, useful. I feel like I've also seen people use bench for like uh, things that weren't like a microsecond or whatever, like, um, like maybe that's an incorrect use of bench, but like, I feel, is there a setting? I forgot, I need to look, I could look it up, but where you can say, I just want to run it this many times or whatever, or not like as many times as possible in like half a second or whatever it is. Um, I mean, it has two um, defaults, right? Which is min iterations. It might have max iterations too. Um, oh, okay. Maybe that was what I was thinking of. Um, yeah, there's a max iterations field. I have it actually up on my computer. So, um, yeah, so you could probably do that where you have some ma you set a max iteration if you have something that's bigger. But it's like not really what it's designed for. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, because I, I mean, I guess it's like this is talking about like things as a comparison of each other, whereas um, like profiling is not. It's kind of like I have one piece of code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. So. See if I stop sharing this. Um, start sharing. Okay, can you see my R screen now? Very small. Yeah, the text is small. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, that's how I code. Sorry. <laughs> Looks bigger on my monitor, I swear. Is that big enough or would you like it one bigger? A little more would be good. Yeah. Is that good or? It looks pretty it. good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, what this is is just a really um, convoluted uh, and uh, naive way to build a ensemble of models to predict beer awards, okay? Um, I didn't check this for any sort of validity in the sense of like, was this the right way to do this? More just to profile something. Um, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt and don't, uh, you know, ostracize me too much for the actual data science. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're gonna run 20 bootstraps. Um, I have a neural net in a random forest uh, and it's gonna be half neural nets is what this is doing. We've got our packages that we're gonna need, we bring in the data, we make some sample the test data, which is 5% here. We make sure that all of our, um, you know, our output is, a, our, our vector, our value we wanna predict is a factor. And we do a little bit of um, feature engineering just to make some extra variables, okay? Um, our data set is just, um, it, it just has, brewery, state, category, year, and then um, the things we created. And there's gold, silver, and bronze are the levels, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some uh, bootstrap samples. And so do, to do that, we're just going to um, slap a whole bunch of things together here with, um, is this right? Yeah, maybe it's right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so we're gonna make a bunch of bootstraps and we're going to stick the bootstraps together in a list and they're going to be up samples, which we actually don't have to do because this data is balanced, but sure, we're gonna up sample. 
and uh, we're going to make sure that we have an equal number of um, metal types. Then we're going to use the first half, the neural nets, second half, random forests. We're going to run through uh, each bootstrap sample, and we're going to build a model, OK? Um, and we're going to do some sampling in here to sub-select sub variables at random and uh, use those for the model, because why not? And then we're going to randomly select the number of trees we're going to use between 100 and 1,000, because again, why not? Um, then we're going to make some predictions. And our predictions are just going to be a for loop. And we're going to make a prediction on uh, one of these new beers uh, for each one of the different models. And then we're going to add up all of the um, prediction probabilities and figure out which one had the highest prediction probability when you sum up them across all models. And that's going to be our prediction. All right. So not a particularly uh, elegant way to do this, nor do I think it's statistically correct. But um, that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to print a confusion matrix. All right. This takes a little bit of time to run because the neural nets aren't the fastest thing in the world. So I've actually already profiled it for us. And will it show up? Yeah. <clears throat> and so Jake, I think as you were saying, we run into this problem here where this is not a particularly useful um, time series. And um, so I, I think the first thing I noticed when I looked um, is that you know the four transections, which are I'm guessing the random forest, are not particularly you know like that's not informative, but also like it's taking up a huge amount of time. And uh, one cool thing I noticed is that you can actually zoom in. Let's see if it will do it. There we go. So you can see kind of smaller sections here. So. The Fortran is actually built off of after multinom, which is the neural net. So this is one training of the neural net, is what this Fortran section is. So that's what's taking up a lot of our time. You can go back if you double click. I don't know if it'll actually work. Okay. Um, and so then, the bit. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Jake. No, go ahead. I, go ahead. Or, I don't know, Josh. At the beginning, so like the very, very beginning like before the Fortran, that's like all yeah. your cleaning and stuff, right? Yeah. It's such a small fraction of, yeah. It's yeah, let's see if it'll actually zoom in. This is, uh, uh, it's not, 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 as, not as friendly as it wants to be. Anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got like our library loading, Imports, which took yeah. up a small amount of time. And then, you know, after that's over, I think all the cleaning takes almost no time at all. Yeah, it's cool yeah. to see on there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we get the section at the end, right? And so this is, you know, probably 60% of it. And then we have this section at the end, which looks to be, and we can look up here, um, to be mostly this um, prediction section. So we're running a try catch to make sure because sometimes variables get thrown out that causes us to make an error, and this is written hastily. Um, but we have a lot of data that's being um, pushed back out and uh, from the um, garbage collector. So there's probably a way to uh, clean this up so that we're not, you know, for loop recreating preds time and time and time again. I think that's, you know, if you used dplyr and like add prediction, you might be able to do this without needing any loops. Um, so, I, I, you know, this is kind of one of those gotchas right here. Um, and we see that, like, I think there is, like, I, I you know, can't tell you where it is, but there is garbage collectors all throughout this thing. So, you know. So where, uh, sorry, where is this part on your, on the bottom uh, flame chart on the? Uh, this would be here, this section over here. Oh, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, okay. this is all of the predictions here. So right. it's uh, it's harder when it's zoomed in. But, yeah, so the top section... Uh, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, so it, it's also difficult because, like, so this takes a fair amount of time, but we can't measure it in our because it's not our code; it's all Fortran, so it doesn't actually show up as anything. Um, and then this doesn't take any time because it's uh, this small bits of C code is the uh, neural net, or sorry, the random forest. 
And then the thing that we really have any control over, which I guess kind of tells you what you can do and what you can't do when you're trying to um, improve performance is, uh, is all this section down here. So um, I guess what I would do is probably try and rewrite this so that I don't have to use a for loop. It's probably the main thing I would do with this section. Um, yeah, so I wonder if I, if I go to data, what it looks like. So yeah, Fortran is a huge time suck. And then SFI. Yes, these are the predictions and the try catch. So this is my loops here. And again, like I think we were, I pointed out the function, if you have anonymous functions, it's impossible to tell what's going on. And so this is, this is really that problem. So uh, one thing I might do to make this better is to in, instead of having this s apply run on this function i may just make this function ahead of time if i'm worried about speed and i want to be able to read it better um yeah i don't know if you guys write code like this a lot where you have like an s apply you know and then you have segments inside it no not really yeah i'm on that right per train uh, <laughs> i use per um yeah, I use per like inner like interspersed with uh, applies. I use s apply even though we're not supposed to. Only when I think that I know what the output's going to be. Um, yeah, okay. like if I can control what the output's going to be, but otherwise I'll use map or something like that. To... But I usually always make the function ahead of time and then just call it as a one liner. Even yeah. in like a for loop, I'll still make a function and then the for loop is just for I do that one thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't usually put it inside like that. Yeah, I feel like this is how I learned how to do it when I was uh, maybe in grad school and then like I never unlearned it. And so now I'm starting to like atomize a lot of this stuff and, you know, move this stuff out of here. But anonymous functions have probably been my greatest arson. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of speed, I think it's the same, right? Like, uh... Like per, doing that in per versus a for loop. I think you're right. Like a, like a map or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're. It's more like cleaning up. Um, like the, the readability of, of it. Yeah, of what's going to come out and make sure everything's um, easier to debug. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, I think like. I still find this to be quite daunting, and I feel like I'd have to do have a lot of reps at this to really figure out how to make this. Um, it's like too much. Useful. It's like too in the weeds, you know. Because like I don't know, I called ggplot or something, and it's like every little step along the way is all in there. And it, it'd be nice if it was. I mean, you can collapse them, but even when you collapse them, it still seems like it's too in the weeds. Am I wrong? Like we're like you've got is then a halfway down like that wasn't a yeah so I, like, I what think, the heck is that <laughs> yeah so i think it's like these are each each line has its own one and so like this contains all this other stuff right mm -hmm. but then i think also like other stuff down here is is like is a different related line possibly like it's a it is difficult to read though and sorry, I forgot. Is this is this uh, chronological, or is it, or are they just? It's like a library of everything you've called. This is um, by how much time it took. So oh, the largest section is the Fortran one. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. And I don't think you can sort it, so it's just by time. Yeah. And it's and it's every every call of that function is represented in that time, or is yeah. it? Okay. No, it's it, it's it's one representation. So like this is all the Fortran is this row here. Yeah. So yeah. that's every time the neural net was built. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then this and is And then can time. you go back to the flame graph? Yeah. So like the neural net we have here. So, but the percentage of tracked execution time is super low because it can't track the Fortran code. So like this page isn't actually that informative unless you look at the bottom part, which is the total actual time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
So I guess that's one of the big things about R is that if you're using functions that call other languages, you can't really, well, you don't have control over them anyway, but you can't really debug much of, you know, or, or improve performance on much of that or understand that it's using a lot of your, your time. Mm -hmm. So like the execution time there for something like that is just like moving the output to an R object or something. Yeah, I guess so. It must be, I mean, this part here, right? Cause there's an allocation. This, this requires some allocation of resources for like a garbage collector. So that's mm -hmm. probably these little slivers here. Yeah, there's a garbage collector in there somewhere. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so guessing these are the things that require time. And maybe, um, yeah, the Fortran is, yeah. C bind part of the multi-nome function there? Or is that somewhere in your code? I feel like C bind might be happening when you're making those columns up at the top. I'm really not sure though. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's, it, if it's part of this because we were zoomed in where I thought was, right? Because we're here, we're in this four transaction, or sorry, yeah, in this four transaction is, can we get it to light up on anything? So this is the multi-nome call somewhere in here. Like, can you search this thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is chaos. So, all right. So this is the call of multi-nome. So that's it's highlighting the right line above, right? This is mul This is it okay. here. That's right, and you can see it's highlighting the color down there. So oh, yeah. when it does that, so multi-nome runs here, and it's got you know a model matrix, and it's got all this other stuff going on, and then it's also calling it here. Yeah, oh, C binds. C binds inside the multi -nome. multi -nome, yeah, yeah. It's called because yeah. like whenever anything is stacked on top of something, it's with it. It's inside that call of the function below it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, it seems like what's happening is at some point in time, presumably, presumably, let's just say this is the start of an iteration here, right? There's a multi -nome somewhere here, probably this, which does the the defaults and the C bind and then a garbage collection. And then it has some kind of C that runs and then there's some additional processing and then it runs Fortran. So this might be pre-processing on the data and then this is the neural net training. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is the most we can potentially debug this and we can't do anything with this code at all. So yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I feel like if I was to try and make this faster, I think the only thing I could tackle is this section here. Um, and uh, just for your uh, your own personal amusement, the accuracy of this model was 33%. Mm. How many categories are there? Or... Uh, three, bronze, silver, and gold. Oh, okay. So not the most accurate model ever. Um, I'm pretty sure one of these neural, uh, neural nets or random forests could probably do a better job. But it was more fun to try and do this this way. No, this is awesome. It's really cool. If you pass it a, a deep plier chain, how does it analyze that? Do you know? So like, um, yeah. So I have the only deep plier I use is probably here. So I wonder if we just... I'm always going to get gear and just mess with gear. Um, group by metal, and then filter uh, on ale. Anything else we want to do? Summarize, maybe? See what that looks like. 
Sure. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Why is it telling me? Oh no, live coding. Oh, beer's not found. That's funny. Beers. All right. Um, so no source is not available. Interesting. And I think this has been my experience of, of profits. <laughs> <laughs> Almost no information. Yeah. So I wonder if I don't put the curly brackets, what happens? Hmm. Yeah, I can't do anything without the curly brackets. What does it do? Is there no output? Uh, there's an error output, which you guys can't see. It's on my other screen, um, which is, um, I'll just drag it over so you can see that. Uh, maybe your function was too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it is interesting just to even just the stuff that was produced though, uh, with the summarize and form. I think that's that, that statement that's like, you're still like, we retained the grouping or whatever it says. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whenever you do a summarize a group and then summarize it, like we retain the grouping. Uh, I forget what it says, but uh, and then the pace, I guess, is just printing the output uh, of the result of the data frame. Yeah, I'm guessing so. I wonder if this is a lazy evaluation thing, because you know, if if pretty much all of the way DeepLayer works is built on you know doing operations and not in kind of the order in which you build them, but the way it's it's you know through um, closures and evaluation that it has itself, then um, maybe it just makes this unbelievably ambiguous. Yeah, I mean, it's weird too that they all those functions are happening simultaneously. Like they, they are profiled for the entire period. Yeah. Right? They're all 10 milliseconds. Yeah. I mean, maybe I've made some kind of mistake, but uh, you know. Um, could, is it, could it be that it was too slow or, or I don't know, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, oh, right, but this is profit. Sorry, I thought you were yeah. for a second. I thought you were doing benchmarking. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I don't know what the just right Goldilocks version of this is, though, where you have enough inform like this is providing no information, but then this version is probably providing too much information. So, I'm reading up on, uh, I'm just looking up like Stack Overflow, Profits, and Tidyverse. Is it, is there utility to it or? I'm trying to see if like, it seems like people have trouble with it. Um, hmm. Huh, I mean, they get, Output though. Let's see. Let me just paste one of these into the chat. <coughs> oh, I think the paste is because it's giving us this um, this warning. That's probably the the, the group. Yeah, yeah. Here, try what I what I put in the chat and see what that um, what that profile looks like. How big is the beers data set? Um, like 4,000, 5,000 rows. It's not, that, not big, but not small. Yeah, it doesn't give you anything on there. Yeah. That's weird. Because, um, I mean, I see like a, a issue in, in uh, 
on GitHub that like has people screen share, sharing screenshots of that output. And it has output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has like a flame graph and data. When you do it, there's nothing on the data tab. No, so I don't huh. know what. I don't know what's causing our, uh, our problem. Hmm. I wonder if you try this on your own computers, do you get the same result I do, or do you have a different result? Let's see. Let me try it out. I don't think I have profits because I also upgraded recently. It's doing something. Oh yeah, I get the same thing. Source is not available. Hmm. I mean, I get, I get like a profile, like a, uh, I guess it's called the flame chart on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, did you get that? Yeah, I have this. Uh, oh, okay, I didn't see that. Um, yeah, but the kind of like table representation uh, or like side by side with the code doesn't. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's cause I was, wait, hold on. Oh no, I ran it in a script. Hmm. Let's see. The only difference with my code is that he's loading dplyr at the beginning. Uh, Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so I guess um, that's all I had for the demo. Um, and I feel like we only learned that uh, it doesn't really do what we want it to do. Well, I just think it, it needs more, uh, like we said, like a, maybe like that Goldilocks zone needs to be yeah. identified a little more. Um, it seems like it's got like a lot of the, the building blocks, just maybe too many of them. <laughs> yeah, and and I think R is difficult. I, I suspect this comes from you know other languages first. Like, I feel like R is a language where we have taken some of this stuff from other languages because it could be useful. But in the end, this is like because we have multiple languages, it, you know, interleaved, and we're built off of other things. It's not going to be as useful. Um, and we're not as computer science heavy. So generally you're trying, you know, like if, if this is, you know, if you follow best practices, you're not really going to get huge performance gains by going and looking through the profiling to find your issue. Um, usually you kind of know, don't do this in a dirty way and you're going to get a you know, clean result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like when I think of profiling, uh, I, I don't do it really, and maybe I should do it more, but, um, I think of like some old code I had that like just was trying to do too much like in one place, like in one function or one loop or whatever. And um, I feel like whenever you like break it up, it's, it's just like easy to see a lot of the time if you have modular code, like where it sucks, like where it's slow, you know, like, I don't know. Like I, I, I can't imagine too many cases where I would use it right now, but um I was thinking about like unit testing and stuff. Like, do you think, do people use profiling in the context of regular kind of standardized testing? Like to see like, oh, maybe even though this isn't slow, like there's a spot in this script where it could be a lot faster because I'm doing something that's like inefficient or silly or, you know, or like it won't scale well. if like I add more stuff to it or, you know, like I just, is there a role for, for this kind of profiling and, and, um, regular testing or, you know, before a release or something, or I don't know. Yeah, like that idea of like trying to give it a very, um, something to see, you know, how, how big can I get it before it really starts crapping out? Um, it's interesting, I'm trying to think of how I might use that. 
Yeah, I, I've had the, that problem um, actually trying to put a new model to kind of production recently where the size of the data is huge, like stupid for what I'm trying to do. And so, you know, I'm moving around gigabyte size um, data frames and I'm performing operations on them. And so I have to split it up into smaller sections. And so I was using profiling to do that, but also I have to figure out what's the maximum amount of this data I can possibly use um, to make constraints on, on the model itself, because it's kind of like a, I could use more data and it's a larger time window to make um, some model predictions on, or I can use a smaller range uh, to make those predictions. And so with the smaller range, I'm going to get better performance, but the larger one, I need to figure out how big I can possibly let it go before it's going to like destroy, um, you know, like our, our instances in, on AWS. So, you know, that's kind mm -hmm. of the, the trade-off. So I'm doing a little bit of this, but not in any kind of scientific way, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think that's what I was talking about. I'm kind of, yeah, imagining someone might do. So are you going to like do tests with different sizes and then like plot like performance across yeah. like different validation sets and stuff and see what it looks like? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of like, um, uh, first of all, with, prof, uh, with profiling, I was able to make it like 20 times faster because I was able to find different sections wow. that were much too slow and then like go back, rewrite them, you know, make sure my logic was smart. But uh -huh. I mean, that was partially just bad code from like a couple of years ago anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, I mean, I've been basically like progressively giving it more and more and then monitoring the memory. And then I have some, uh, I break it up into smaller chunks as I go. So like I'll only run operations on like, you know, a 10th of the data and then I'll just put it all back together, um, you know, and so, I might have to use less than a tenth if I if if I understand it's going to get too too big, or I can make you know just a constraint on the number of rows, to see what the time of performance is. So it's kind of like playing with a few of those things to see what's kind of the maximum um, utility or speed and and the you know that has the best performance. So it's kind of finding that that frontier. Cool. Um. Yeah, on the on a similar topic, after the R conference, I tried. Uh, I saw the. Did you guys go to the Apache Arrow? Uh, yeah. Talk. Um, I tried using it, and and I mean, because you were talking about this like a huge data set, Josh, and like I was like I had something similar with some log files, and I was like, oh, like you know, he said it was great for strings and you know str data with characters, and like so I I tried it and like you know partition partitioned it and all that. But like then when I was reading it in, I realized that that you can only do like a couple operations on it. You can like filter and like like count or something like that. Or and I couldn't like summarize. I couldn't like group by. Like I couldn't. You like I don't know. I, I was just it was surprising to me and like um, I don't know that. So that, it like reads it in as some sort of object that you can't interact with. Is that what you're saying? You can. So like yeah, it's like. It reads it in it's kind of like in your environment i guess like in uh i don't know like distributed like I, I don't even know i don't really understand how it works in memory but it's like some special representation that you can like and it's like partitioned and like i partition partition it by like user or whatever because it was like log files by user sure. um and then yeah so like if you're doing something where you're saying i want to like filter for the first five uh, events per user or something and then um, and then but like if you wanted to like like summarize in any way you have to do a collect operation where it takes it all from the distributed state and filters or whatever it does uh, in parallel but then it brings it back to to R in like a data frame and then you can do whatever you want with it but um, anyway I, I just it felt like 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 I was like oh this is so cool like it's gonna solve all these like problems where I have a lot of data and memory you know and um, or on disk or whatever and then uh, like I was I was like well I can't do much it seems like I don't know I I just yeah yeah it sounds a lot like uh, Spark and like Hadoop where you push things out to push things out to clusters and then you reduce you know so you can do a lot of really small operations that only rely on the data around them in each cluster. And then you can, and then to do something smarter, you have to aggregate across them. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, I saw it when I worked at Apple, but I have not dealt with it here. Um, I haven't felt any real need to use that level of distribution of a system. I'll just destroy my MacBook first or, you know, some cloud. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, I, that's why I was excited about Arrow because I was like, oh, you know, you don't have to set up a cluster. You can just, like, take advantage of what your computer has in, like, a smarter way. But um, I don't know. Like, like, I don't know, like, how you do anything that's, like, super useful with that. Because, like, the examples you showed were, like, like counting, like how many, I don't know, I forget what it was, like a taxi cab data set or something. Like he's doing some kind of filter and count and it was like, you know, 10 times faster than data table um, at doing it. And so it's, it's still pretty cool, but like only if you're like reducing it in some way that like Arrow can handle before you do whatever you want to do to it. Yeah. Um, uh. Yeah, I think it's like, Distributed data reduction is is kind of the best utility for those sort of systems. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the cool thing about like Spark is it has a lot of like machine learning libraries and stuff, and you can, um, I don't know, like I feel like sometimes I think with some of that, it like it figures out the planning of like how it distributes it, like so you don't have to deal with that. And um, but but yeah. Um, Anyway, this, um. so uh, for next week is uh, uh, Mike had said he would do it, but uh, yeah, he said he would do it if, if there wasn't anyone else who kind of jumped and wanted to, was 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 itching to do it. Um, uh, so, uh, do you guys do you guys want to do it? Uh, anyone here want to do it? Jake or Jorge. What's next week? Um, improving performance? Is impro yeah, improving performance. I can um, do it. Jorge, you want to do it? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, I think I think Mike was only going to do it if, if like other, no one else like jumped in. So um, yeah, that'd be great if you could do it. Um, cool, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and I said I would take 25, so that would cover us for... Uh, for the rest of the book. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. Uh, thanks, Josh. That was awesome. You, yeah, thank like, you. Clearly put a lot into it. It's pretty pretty cool to see like the real examples and. Uh, you know. Yeah, I was avoiding my real work, so I was like, oh, I can do this <laughs> convoluted example and, and see if it. Some some beer works. beer classification yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll try to find an opportunity to use it and I'll, I'll report back. Um, but it, it was helpful yeah. to kind of see uh, how you were exploring the data. Um, yeah, I, I feel like if the experience someone has is just like the source unavailable, doesn't really show me anything, then you wouldn't feel it motivating or that like huge stack of stuff. So I don't know. Yeah, I dug around a little bit and found a little bit useful, but. I don't know, once you get the, the stuff in other languages, I don't know if I really want it, like it's not really telling me anything, so. Yeah, well, we should check out that, um, what is it called again, X -pro XR prof? XR yeah. Prof. To see. The install was like a little convoluted for my interest for setting it up for this class, but if I do find that I need um, to be digging into C code, I, it seems like he built it explicitly for that purpose. Hmm. So you tried to install it and uh, I looked at the GitHub and then it was more than just, you know, download the package and go. And I was like, all right, well, I will tell them about it and that will be what I'll do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Have a good evening. Right. You guys have a good evening. See you. Bye. Bye.